Welcome to The Real Heal. I am your host, Dr. Renee Wallenstein, also known as The Libidoologist. So if you're ready, let's get into it. Sarah, I am so excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. And, you know, I have to say, as we, before we hit record, you know, I've had experts on the show. One specifically is a good friend of mine talking about infertility and like mm-hmm. more of the medical side of it. Um, mm-hmm. But today we're going to dive more into the mindset mm-hmm. component of infertility. And maybe we'll touch a little bit on pregnancy loss too, because I sometimes feel that goes hand in hand, not necessarily Absolutely. all the time, but mm-hmm. I do have a lot of women in my audience who have or are either going through infertility or have had that miscarriage, maybe two, maybe three. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're really struggling. So I think, uh, you know, we're going to take a deep dive into those emotions and how to try to help women in my audience suffering, struggling with those emotions, struggling with those, um, conditions to try to navigate through it the best they can. But before we get into all of that, why don't you tell us who you are and what you got or how you got doing what you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, The short answer is I'm Sarah Brandell. I am an infertility life and mindset coach. Um, The longer answer is that I relate to you and a lot of people you have on the podcast um, in that I got started in my career in conventional medicine. So I went the typical route of going to school and deciding what I was going to do and wanting to work in medicine and going to graduate school and becoming a PA Um, and you do that kind of process where you're like, if I study enough and get the right grades and do all the right things, I'm going to be successful. Um, and so I worked in emergency medicine and in primary care, and I really enjoyed that. Honestly, I had a a lot of fun, especially in the emergency room of being able to quickly make the decision. Is this somebody who I need to do something about today, or are they going to be okay to go home and kind of work with this out with their PCP or whoever else? Um, and then My husband and I got to the point where we decided, hey, it's time to, you know, start growing our family. I had gone to school, got married, got the job, bought the house, done all the things, right? It's time to do the next step. And that didn't come so easily for us. So um, it took us probably about a year and a half to get pregnant with my daughter. Um, And we were actually pregnant before her and had our first miscarriage our first pregnancy. And that was really tough. And I'm someone who was working in the ER and seeing people have miscarriages and knowing that they're not uncommon, even though they feel like they are. Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of navigating healing from that and working through that and accepting that and still trying to stay positive for the future. Um, It took us medicine, it took us like ovulation medications to get pregnant both times, the miscarriage and with my daughter. Um, So I thought, okay, that was difficult, but it was doable, right? And then probably when she was about nine-ish months old, I decided, okay, it took a while. So let's get started on the next one because we want to have a handful of children. Um, And this month, we are officially three years into trying for that second one. So it's been a whole nother ball game, right? So um, we've had two miscarriages. We've done many, many cycles of um, ovulation meds. I have seen many OBs, many reproductive specialists, many functional medicine practitioners. Um, I have worked with fertility nutritionists, fertility physical therapists, done acupuncture, done it all, right? Like going through the steps, taking times where I was doing no medication and trying to go more from the natural route for long periods of times, um, doing a lot of different things. And that's really what pulled me into like, okay, what, how do I want to, you know, alter my career into this thing that's become my passion. So I actually also went and got training in functional medicine, um, got my certification in functional medicine and, thought maybe that would be the route that I would go right from my career standpoint. But one of the things that I started to see in myself and then started to see in others and patients that I would talk to is there's a lot of things and a lot of them are super helpful. And I'm super passionate about like, there can be a mixture of conventional medicine and functional medicine and integrative and all this stuff together, right. As an integration. Um, but it's easy to bounce 
right? Like, let me do that supplement protocol. Let me go do this lab workup. Let me just check my hormones. Oh, this person over here says, if I do this new diet and we just keep bouncing around. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, my like mental health, how I felt about myself, how I felt about my body, um, how I was navigating these repeat miscarriages. Now I've had three, um, wasn't going well. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until I started to like go within and like, just get present of like, rather than fighting against, Hey, this is our journey. It's not going to be simple. Like it is for some. Um, and yeah, starting to work through that, I decided, you know, I want people to have access to all those great things to work through their fertility, but I want to be the one to help them feel sane through the process because it is a roller coaster. Um, it's hard to keep wanting, wanting to keep going, right. And knowing that you can keep going and affording it and navigating things with your spouse and all of that and people's opinions coming at you. And so that is what I do now. I actually don't see patients clinically. I just work one-on-one -on -one, um, and coach people through the mindset, whatever their journey is. Right. So, yeah, that's so, oh, wow. You, what a story. I'm sorry yeah. you're going through that, but you know, you're the expert now. Like you, you know, you're not the one just saying, oh, let me try to picture how you feel like you're feeling. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. both from the infertility aspect and the recurrent miscarriage aspect, and it's tough unless you go through it, you don't know how it feels. And exactly. so like, you know, and I do see there's like, it's hard to wear both hats of clinical and especially with a topic, in my opinion, like this, it's like, you know, with me doing functional medicine, mm -hmm. uh, online and more of the health component, I can infuse a bit of the mindset or a mm -hmm. lot of the mindset, but I feel for these topics, mindset in and of itself needs to be its own category. Like you need to just focus on that because it is a daily grind when you're dealing yeah. with something like this. Um, as an OBGYN, you know, I used to always see women coming in and I saw a lot of the uh, mind of the emotional struggles with infertility mm -hmm. and also obviously recurrent miscarriage. And, um, it, it's true. You know, like, I'm glad there's people like you out there that are just focusing and helping women emotionally get through this because it's tough. And a lot of times you feel alone, mm -hmm. you feel like you're the only one going through it. And just to have, you know, just number one, knowing you're not alone, but number two, having you there by their side, holding their hand on those good days and more than not, not so good days. Right. 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 Um, absolutely. Yeah. And know, I, a couple of things. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think it, it too, like I experienced this when I would go and seek someone to like help support me. And now I hear it from clients of like, it's nice to have someone who wants to dedicate their time to that part. But also like when you throw out the word like cervical mucus charting or you know, Avadrill or getting a hysteroscopy, like you're like, oh yeah, I understand those things. It's not someone who's looking at you like, what the heck is that stuff? Yeah. So yeah. It, yeah. And I also have to say this for those listeners that are dealing with this, you know, I, I know, and I often say this when I'm coming from my area of expertise, like mindset is never sexy, right? Like, right. It's not sexy. Everyone wants to, like you said, know the protocols, know the supplements, know like what diet. And when we start talking about like getting really deep and, and talking about the mindset or the, you know, navigating the finances and relationship and the mindset around that it's not sexy. So everyone's like, why don't I sweep it, sweep it under the rug? Like, okay, give me this, what supplement, you know, like what right. should I try next? And, right. you know, I'm, I, in my opinion now of being in medicine for over 20 years now, and like sort of, I kept pulling back, back, back. When you look at the big picture, really what's foundational is this mindset. Yeah. Like of everything. It's so fun everything, everything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, honestly, I, a lot of times I feel now my perspective has changed from my conventional training and you had conventional training as well. Like we, we knew nothing about mindset, right? Right. right. But now in like observing, like how someone's mindset can literally change their health and, you know, and help mm -hmm. with their fertility and, mm -hmm. um, in your belief to get pregnant, all the things yeah. like, you know, I, you can either make or break it a lot of times with how you feel and how you think. Um, so we're going to take a deeper dive into that, um, as we move forward. But, um, I mean, this is really broad, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and there are a lot of ups and downs in the emotional roller coasters with say infertility. We'll talk about infertility 
Mm -hmm. a little bit separately from uh, recurrent miscarriage, but tell us where do you even begin to help women navigate those emotions? Yeah, that's a, a good question because a lot of people come to me almost feeling like disconnected, right? Like I am just trying to get through the motions, do the steps, follow everything. And so I have really like walled off mm-hmm. how I'm feeling. I don't remember what my hobbies are. I don't remember what I like to do. I don't feel like I can schedule a vacation because, oh my goodness, what if it conflicts with timing of things, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that's really step one is yeah. to build more safety and like, it's okay to feel it all right? The, the point of this isn't to say like, oh, you need to get to that, like kumbaya positivity space. I believe it's going to work 100% of the time because that's not realistic. No. Um, and to just help them learn that, you know, it is safe to allow those emotions to come up and to process them and sit with them and be with them. And that's really what I guide women through, um, is how to do that. And I seem to attract a lot of women like me who are like type A, like, let me just put those over there. Right. And this is really like the, the groundwork that we have to do before we can really work through anything else. And it's funny you said that because one of my other like questions was, you know, from my observation, many women bury their emotions and they consider a job to get pregnant. Like they become robots, like, just tell me the next steps. Tell me what I have to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they repress those emotions. And so you're saying like, obviously it's okay to feel those emotions. I think a lot of women just, they don't want to go that down that rabbit hole of, um, I don't want to say negative emotions, but the ones that hurt, you know, like the mm-hmm. sadness and the fear mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, how, how do you create that safe place? Like, where do you, where do you guide them? If like, I don't even want to go there because once I open up a can of worms, like it's going right. to Pandora's small. box. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, exactly. I, I relate to that because I experienced that, but I hear that so often. Like when I had my first miscarriage, if you would have told me that I would have been through what I've been through now, right? Like, and been able to manage going through as much more pain that I've gone through now, I would have never believed you. So it, it truly is um, helping women learn what it's like to allow an uncomfortable emotion. Um, and, you know, like I said, my conventional medicine type a brain. When I first got told that with my coach years ago, I was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Um, but truly just, you know, we all have that experience when like the cop pulls behind us, but they're not meant for us. And you have that gut feeling reaction that happens. We have those sensations in our body with every emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, and the more we connect to them and feel them and know what they feel like and know what doubt about this cycle actually feels like in my body. Um, Know what sadness that this was another cycle where we had another negative pregnancy test um, feels like in your body, it becomes less scary, Mm -hmm. right? It becomes less like, oh my gosh, that's something that I can't do. I like don't even know how to potentially go there to like, oh, like this isn't fun. I don't want to live here feeling fear, doubt, sadness, whatever the emotion is, but I know I'm capable to do it. Mm-hmm. The The other thing that I helps with, I think helps with the safety is it's very easy for our brain from like a young, young age. I hear myself saying this to my daughter of it's okay. Stop crying. Right. Like mm-hmm. we, we talk them out of feeling their emotions, mm-hmm. um, is we think if I open up to this uncomfortable emotion, it's just going to consume me. It's never going to go away. I'm just going to be stuck in doubt forever. Right. Um, And what's actually more true is the less I resist it and ignore it, the more I sit here and like describe what it feels like to feel doubt, the faster it goes away. Mm -hmm. Um, And so once we learn that, I think you start to lessen the fear of feeling those emotions. Mm -hmm. What do they say? What you resist persists. Yes. And I think sometimes, yeah, fighting those suppressed emotions actually just eats away at you to the point where eventually you might just have a complete breakdown versus like letting, letting them seep out little by little and feel them. And like you said, feel them in your body. Because I think a lot of times, like you said, especially with infertility treatments, you're getting tested, you're getting ultra, you're getting probes up your vagina, you're getting injections, you're getting like you become like, you feel like this like experiment of like, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? And so Mm -hmm. like you are disconnected from your body Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I feel like what you're saying is like reconnect with your body and 
feel those feelings, but how are they feeling in your body? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely a, a mindfulness component here, because again, you know, so easy for us to disconnect from this vessel that carries the babies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But we really have to reconnect to that beautiful vessel that it mm -hmm. is. And, and that, and I know, you know, an emotion is like get mad at our bodies because they're not working the way we want them to work. Right. Absolutely. Super common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's just, um, just pivot one second to recurrent pregnancy loss or yeah. even just one miscarriage because yeah. one, two, three gets harder, obviously every time, because I feel like after one, you're told, oh, 20, 25, 20 to 25% of women have a miscarriage, like a little, maybe dismissive from your doctor, right? Like, oh, yeah. go, just go try again. Right. Yeah. Like, okay, let me mourn this loss, regardless of how early it was, how late it was, it was still a wanted a loss. baby, mm -hmm. a loss. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, and so many women feel alone, like how do you help women navigate those emotions of, of fear, especially if it's more than, you know, just one, a lot of times women feel fearful. It's going to happen again. Right. Mm -hmm. Loneliness again, they feel like they're alone. I feel like with recurrent miscarriage, there's less or even one miscarriage period, there's less of a conversation versus infertility. I feel like there's a little more buzz around infertility and a lot of women putting their stories out there to help other women. But I do feel like the miscarriage world, we don't talk about, it's like this taboo topic. Unless one woman mentions that, oh, I, I had one too. It's like, there's like secret society, right? Yeah. So how do you yeah. help these women? Like the fear, the loneliness, probably the anger that this keeps yeah. happening. Why me? Yeah. How do we process those emotions? Absolutely. I can relate because when I first had my first miscarriage, my grandmother was like, oh yeah, I had four of those. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. Right? Like no idea. Um, so it is that thing that's just not talked about. Um, and I think some of that is just, it wasn't something that was safe, comfortable to talk about with others, but also once you're past it and you've moved on, it's not fun to go back and talk about painful things all the time. So um, that is definitely something that can be really helpful is to put yourself into spaces where some of that is happening. Now, mm -hmm. I definitely think you have to be careful with that because it can be a lot of even actually making it more fearful, right? To be surrounded by that. Um, but one of the things that I love to kind of use the phrase that I use often, people will hear me say is the phrase, of course. So our brain right? It doesn't have information about the future. Nobody can. I would love for it too. So when we decide, oh, like I want to have this child and I'm going to go forward and have this, you know, try again. And I have this history of loss or stillbirth or multiple losses or whatever it was. Um, our brain's job is to like, go back and like assess the past. What has happened, right? Like what has been successful, what hasn't been successful mm -hmm. and use that to like calculate what's likely going to happen. So of course, I always say, of course, your brain's having a little bit of a freak out. Of course, it's like, oh my goodness, I want this so bad. And now this has happened and I'm mourning that loss and I'm, you know, working through that. And I'm terrified of what this means for my future. Um, and I think like just a little bit of compassion for yourself, like it's okay for it to be difficult, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's okay for it to take some time. I think one of the big things in the loss space or loss topic is women feel very confused of what's the right way to manage the loss. Like what's the right way to grieve the loss? Should I just move on and just try again next month? Should I take six months off? You know, like what's the right thing for me to do? And the answer is there isn't a right thing, right? It is what feels good to you. Um, and um, what feels best for you and everybody's different, right? Um, we, we had, we got pregnant with Harper exactly one cycle after our miscarriage and that felt right to us. Now I work with clients who are six, eight, nine months past a miscarriage and like, they can't imagine trying again yet. And that's okay. Um, so it, it's different for everyone and that's okay. It's all about having compassion for yourself. Um, allowing again, those emotions to come up, learning that it's okay to process the grief and be with the grief. Um, Cause that is one that absolutely feels all consuming. Um, and that takes time. It's not going to go away. I hate when I hear people say like, wait till you've processed the grief before you try again. That, that doesn't exist, right? Like you are always going to mourn the loss of those losses. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to have different intensities for the rest of your life but it's always going to be there somewhere. Um, so yeah, I think that answers what you were asking. 
Yeah. And you know, I, I was just, I mean, I had a miscarriage myself that really, um, after my twins had just turned one mm. and I remember telling my husband, he's like, what, what do you mean? How'd this happen? I'm like, what do you mean? How'd this happen? <laughs> And then I miscarried. My son got Kaksaki. I had to take care of him. I have twins. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, and it was uh, shortly after I was exposed, I, I miscarried probably around mm-hmm. six, seven weeks. So it was early, but nonetheless, even, I don't want to say that wasn't a wanted pregnancy. It was just unplanned. Yeah. It was certainly wanted, but nonetheless, like that, those emotions of like, especially when you're passing a pregnancy on your own, like every time you go to the bath, it's like this, like gut-wrenching like sorrow yeah of like what what was already had plans this this baby he's not you know six, not even six weeks yeah. had a car seat we're planning on a bigger car like oh my gosh yeah. what about a house you know like mm-hmm. the plans that you start already making for this our child that's already loved it's not even here yet you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah you're mourning you're mourning what would have been not just you yeah. know what was but what would have been that you've already imagined could have been right so yeah yeah. So it's, uh, I, I definitely hear a lot that you're, you're saying, and, and again, going through it once is hard enough. I can't imagine going through it two, three times at how much harder it gets, but like, mm-hmm. like you said, you know, a lot of the coaching you do helps process through that and the grief never goes away. And that's what really what hit me, because when you said that I actually every year and it's been, my kids are 15. So it's been yeah. 14 years. I can every year around November, I think about that. And I'm like, Hmm, Mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. baby would have been, you know, yeah, 15 this year, you know, mm-hmm. anyhow, like you, you just never forget. Like I, I don't grieve anymore. I'm, but I remember you never forget. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So you do brain-based coaching. What exactly does that mean? Yeah. So when I say brain-based coaching, it's really walking through kind of like the model of how we get to the feelings that we're feeling. Right. And I think that allows me my science logical brain to follow through with what we're talking about. So there is a pattern with which we think things based on what's around us. Right. And then whatever we think creates an emotion, right. That our brain sends off, um, neurotransmitters and hormones and all the stuff that creates that sensation that I'm talking about in our body creates that tingling and heaviness in my chest. when I feel anxious um, creates just this heaviness in my abdomen when I feel really sad. Right. Um, and that comes from those feelings and whatever we're feeling drives what we do. So, um, if we are just 100% of the time feeling just doubt and dread about going into the bedroom and having sex this month, because it's time to, Well, that's totally different than the person that gets to think, oh my goodness, this could be our month. I'm so excited to go have sex and maybe make a baby this month. Um, And those literally just came from people having two different thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not as easy as like, let me just write an affirmation on the window and like repeat it. And now I magically think differently. Um, I don't want to say that, but if we can start to alter those thoughts, we can alter the emotions that are coming up and alter how we show up in the process. Um, And so that's what I mean by brain-based coaching is using that model to kind of run the decisions we make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I help women with a few different things, but one is low libido. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, what just hit me is like, I've never really addressed infertility as far as low libido, because it does become- yeah, just because it becomes, and it's interesting. I did training for a certification for my friend on the subject and, um, it's very real. And I, I probably moving forward should put a little bit of effort <laughs> and, you know, cause there is, yeah. I mean, infertility, I, I don't know, you'd probably know the statistics currently better than I do, but it's, it's, I think it's on the rise. I think it, yeah, it's, yeah. it was on the rise when I was still practicing, you know, obstetrics and gynecology. So yeah, it used to be, you know, all the awareness shirts and things. They all say one in eight that used to be one in eight experience infertility. Um, there's been some new studies this year that have come out that say it's officially one in six. Um, so definitely increasing. Um, and it does, it absolutely affects our mindset around libido and like having to schedule sex and Mm -hmm. not wanting to do it elsewhere or having a loss and like feeling terrified to go back to be intimate. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot there. So there's a lot 
there. And not only that, like the anger, because I remember I felt a little angry that my husband didn't know what I was going through when I was miscarrying. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the miscarriage component. Like, you don't know what I'm going through. Like, you can just write it off because you're not seeing the blood in the toilet every time I go to the bathroom, you know, like, yeah. um, so like there could definitely be a, a wall put up there. Like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go there. Like, you don't understand what is going on with my body and me, you know? So Mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of, of things that, that go into that. But like you said, you know, just like becoming the robot in the, the lab experiment with, Mm -hmm. you know, ultrasounds and such, you become like, okay, very programmed when it comes to intimacy. And it's no longer intimacy. It's just sex. You know, like, let's go do it. Like I'm ovulating, let's go, you know? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And then that's, you know, for those five days and then no more for the rest of the month. Cause those five days, every other day or however, however frequently they are active. It's like, that tires me out. Okay. Back to, back yeah. to life. It's kind of right. like everything goes on the back burner for five days. Right. Right. Um, or 10, <laughs> but, uh, it's, you know, it's definitely something that I'm going to moving forward now talking to you. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Like this is yeah. huge. like, mm-hmm. and it's a topic that I really think, thank you. I'm going to, of course, say, of like, course, women out there need to be to understand that it's a very real, and again, it's the the whole reason to be talking about is like, you're not alone. Like, absolutely. You're right. And like, it's not like to say it's a bad thing just to raise awareness. Like this happens and you're not Mm -hmm. alone. It's like a lot of other women, um, have to go through this as well, you know, and they're Mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully we'll be like at the end of the tunnel, but in the meantime, you just ride the wave. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have a podcast. Yes. And I was trolling the podcast. What's the podcast called? The Path to Motherhood podcast. So I I actually have trolled through. I'm like, these are great episodes. So take a listen. If you are dealing with anything that we're talking about today, please go take a listen to our podcast because we're going to touch on a few subjects, but if you mm-hmm. want to deeper dive into some of these subjects, definitely go take a listen. But you, um, you have one entitled what to do when we find ourselves buffering. Yeah. What does that, what, what does buffering mean? So buffering is a great topic because it's something that is helpful for people going through infertility, pregnancy loss, but it's something that anybody can benefit from learning about. Um, so buffering is really what we do when we overindulge in anything, Mm -hmm. um, that we don't want to be overindulging in. So if we get really good at walling off our emotions of thinking, Oh, that's an uncomfortable emotion. I don't want to feel it. I don't want to deal with it. Think like, I had a stressful day at work. I came home. I just don't want to think about how stressful it was. So Mm -hmm. instead I'm going to go watch Netflix all evening. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go eat all the food, not think about what my protocol I would like to be eating is. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people do things buffering that are not necessarily quote unquote bad, right? Like you can buffer with running, Mm -hmm. um, with overworking you can buffer with so many things, scrolling on social media, a super common one. Mm -hmm. Um, and why we call it buffering is it's your brain, like seeking a quick hit of some dopamine, Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. To avoid having to think about what you're not wanting to think about. So avoid Mm -hmm. thinking about being stressed and frustrated from work, avoid being doubtful about this current cycle, avoid dealing with the grieving emotions of your last loss. So whatever that is, it could be a million different things. Um, and it's just your brain trying to go do that. And I always say, it's not that we need to aim for this life where we like never buffer. Right. Um, but it's nice to just be more conscious of it. Um, and decide like, I actively am okay with the fact that I'm buffering right now. Like we've all heard the, like Ben and Jerry's romantic comedy. I don't want to think about that last breakup. Okay. That's for an evening, but when it becomes five weeks, yeah, that's a different situation. Um, and the funny thing is like, we think we're doing ourselves a favor, like, oh, I'm going to go do something relaxing, fun, enjoyable, and avoid thinking about this stress. But really what that tends to do when we do this in a kind of unhealthy way is it adds more pain. So then we start to feel guilty about overeating, about over social media or whatever the thing is, we start to feel shame about Mm -hmm. doing those things. Think, why can't I eat what I said I was going to eat? Why can't I, um, you know, not be on TV all the time and get my work done that I wanted to get done. And so then it actually creates more pain. And if we would have just sat and allowed the stress 
for a couple minutes and then been like, okay, I've like released that. Now I can like move on with my day. It's actually less pain overall. So that's a huge thing that I work with women through, especially women coming to me that do have this team around them of lifestyle habits that they're trying to create and they're finding themselves not following through. Mm -hmm. Um, This is one of the first areas that we focus on of like, well, how often are you not following through because you are buffering? Mm -hmm. And if we would really get better again at that sitting with our emotions, we actually would have the power to the ability to follow through on those lifestyle changes. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yes. It's really foundational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's everything. The the buffering topic of like first, like, cause a a lot of women with infertility, recurrent miscarriage and others trying to do any lifestyle change, right. It's, it's common. And so, um, that's great. Yeah. And I, and I think, uh, you know, buffering, like you said, a little here and there is fine, but I feel like a lot of times we use it as that dopamine hit as the coping mechanism Mm -hmm. to not feel the emotion. And that's when we can get into trouble and we fall off our protocol or, you know, Mm -hmm. another place I've seen buffering show up actually recently for a client and has been a huge deal because we all know how expensive infertility treatments can become. If you go down that route, um, her buffering was like just impulse shopping. Like I'm really sad or I'm really stressed with how things are going right now with the cycle, um, with how much I'm having to focus on this. So let me just go run into TJ Maxx and see what there is. Let me go, you know, run to the mall over here and see if there's any new clothes. I don't need anything. I don't have a reason to be buying, but like, let me just go do it. Cause it's fun to like be in the search of the buy. Um, and she had accumulate accumulated like so much junk that she's like, I don't even know why I have all this stuff. I've wasted so much money that I could be spending on things I want to be spending. Um, and it was all coming from buffering. Mm, yeah. Shopping can be fun, but can be dangerous if you yeah. use it buffer an emotion. Definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So another topic that you talked about on your podcast is something called the belief triad. Can you talk to us about what a belief triad again? I picked that. I'm like, Ooh, what's yeah. this? And I, I yeah. got a little, you're so great on your podcast web in your website, because it gives a little like taste of what it is, but like, yeah it's so much different when you talk about it, like when you hear about it. So tell us about what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So the belief triad, I won't even claim that it was something that like I fully came up with. I came to it from thinking actually from business, right? Like you or I, if we want to go out there and work with women or work with people and we're helping them, um, I really truly believe the relationship between me and a client, like that client should be able to believe in my skill. Mm -hmm. They should be able to believe in the, the, ability of coaching to be helpful and they should be able to believe in their ability to heal, right? Those, Mm -hmm. those three things. Um, and so what I started to see is, oh, that's actually part of the trying to conceive process, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you're going about trying to create a baby and you don't believe your body is working, Mm -hmm. that's going to be pretty hard, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm going through this, and this is a common one that comes up that I don't think it's talked about, but I'm constantly angry at my fertility Mm -hmm. clinic, Uh or I'm constantly feeling like, oh, my fertility clinic is just out to get my money. Um, They're not actually here to help me. That's going to be hard to believe in this process. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're someone who's doing the IVF route, but you don't believe in IVF and you don't really even want to be doing it, then that's probably not the route for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's this triad of like, if I'm going to go about this journey and I decide working with this NAPRO specialist over here and trying to go a more natural route or going over here and working with this functional medicine practitioner is the route I'm going to go, whatever it is, I'm going to find a surrogate, whatever your journey is believing in it, like building belief in the fact that this is the right route for me. It may not be forever. I always tell people like we get to make changes in our path. Mm -hmm. Like we could decide, okay, we tried that and it didn't work. But believing in those three legs of like, yes, this is possible for me. My person I'm working with to help me on this journey is out there to help me get there. And this process we're going to go through is going to be worth it too. Um, And if we're having lack of belief in one of those three things, then we need to work on that. Wow. That's powerful. That's powerful. Again, when it comes to anything, business, health, like it pertains to so many things. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, those are three great questions to ask yourself and embarking on a, any kind of journey, right? Like any kind of change. 
Mm -hmm. Um, ask yourself those three questions, because if there's a no in there, then that's probably not the right choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, this next topic. I'm intrigued. I actually did not look at the show notes for this one. So, okay. Okay. um, you talk about the difference between clean pain and dirty pain. What oh, is that? yeah. Yeah. Clean pain and dirty pain. So we've honestly touched on this a bit. Okay. So clean pain, dirty pain is something we kind of do to ourselves. This comes from like cognitive behavioral therapy and types of things. Um, so let's give an example. Clean pain is like, okay, I just did a cycle and it was unsuccessful. I'm super disappointed. I'm sad. I'm grieving the fact that this cycle didn't work. That's clean pain. That's authentic pain. That's there and reasonable to be there. And sitting with that is healthy and part of our human process, right? Yep. Dirty pain is this is never going to work for me. This is Mm -hmm. terrible. I'm never going to be successful. This is a waste of my time. This is a waste of my money. I'm just bound to be ruined. Like I'm fighting against the process and that Mm -hmm. creates all this extra unnecessary pain that Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be there. So sometimes people will talk about clean pain, dirty pain is like clean pain is that authentic, true, uncomfortable emotions that come up. And dirty pain is the suffering that we like add on to the process. Wow. Right. That's powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I say to be careful about the groups we put ourselves into because social media is amazing. It is. I'm like so grateful for it, but in the world of social media and sharing about infertility and sharing about losses, there can be people who just live in the suffering place and they're only sharing about that suffering stuff. And that can be hard to be like stuck there and feel very defeating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. Some of those groups are great for support, but sometimes you can get those Debbie Downers in there that they want you to feel their suffering as well. Yes. Um, and it's really interesting because something came up when you said that about the groups too. It was like, you know, how do you, it's really hard to navigate, especially in the age of women trying to get pregnant. I'm out of that age now, <laughs> but um, I actually have some people in my world that are still in that realm. Yeah. Um, one, one woman I know specifically just had a miscarriage and I think it's her total of her second miscarriage. First was unplanned. This one was planned. Um, and now her, um, sister in law is pregnant and a best Mm -hmm. friend just got pregnant. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate those emotions of like, you know, women around you getting pregnant, but you're having a hard time receiving and carrying the pregnancy. A big, a big topic in the infertility mindset space is pregnancy announcements. And like, how do I navigate pregnancy announcements and baby showers and things? Um, And I, again, I think it comes back to compassion, right? Like it's easy to go in one of two ways into the, like, I'm just going to hate on everybody that's had it easier than me. And I'm going to be really angry or those emotions about your sister, your friends, your whatever come up. And then you feel really guilty for having them. You beat yourself up for like, Mm -hmm. why am I thinking that way? And what I think is more natural is like when those thoughts come up, when those emotions come up again, my favorite phrase to come back to is like, of course I'm thinking that because I want this so bad. Mm -hmm. I see others having it and I'm like, man, I would love to be in their shoes. It's not anything against them. It's not sliding them in the least, right? Like it's, it's truly about like what I wish I could have. Mm -hmm. So of course I'm having some trouble with this. And if that means that like for a while I can't go to baby showers, that's okay. That's, that is going to be okay. Um, and you don't have to beat yourself up for having some of those thoughts come up. Um, and just, again, having compassion for yourself that it's part of the process. It's okay for it to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's that guilt and shame that they feel because they're feeling those very normal emotions, in my opinion, it's like, right. of course. Of course you uh, Mm -hmm, you want to be in those shoes. So Mm -hmm. I feel like, of course you're going to have those emotions. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and again, the more you try to repress and act happy enough, it's it's, at the end, it's going to come back to bite. You got to feel those emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're going to wrap up, you know, kind of coming back to you, you've you've shared so much um, valuable information as far as how to navigate the world of of infertility and and recurrent miscarriage and like just from the mindset aspect, which is so important. I cannot drive this home enough. Like this is 
before you go the new diet, the new supplement, whatever, find the newest practitioner work on this first, in my opinion. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Because everything else is going to be icing on the cake once we get, you know, our, our minds, right. But, um, my audience always wants to know from the experts, a couple of things such as, do you have a morning routine? Yeah. So when it comes to morning routine, it fluctuates. And so I have to like, give myself grace Mm -hmm. that like, Mm -hmm. Sometimes my morning routine is coming in here in this office, doing a little reading, catching up on a few things. And then I have in the corner over here, a red light that I, when I am not actively trying to conceive, I like to stand in front of and do some meditation. Um, But other mornings it's like, let me get the kid up and get her to school and that's it. And Mm -hmm. it's okay that it's different depending on the day. I love that. I love that. You know, and it's like, I, the reason I'm asking us to hear so much out there about you need a morning routine, two hour day. morning routine. Two hour, and it's so funny you said that. Cause I just said that in a, in a interview last week, like sometimes I think, especially women, we look at the men, like they're sitting there for two, three hours and there's saunas, you know, cold baths, reading yes. all the things. And we're like, we got to get the kids up fed to school. It's like, yes. I don't have that. I'm lucky to have <laughs> 10 minutes to myself. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that. And I love having grace on yourself. Like, this is what I love to do, but some mornings it just doesn't look like that. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, which is exactly why I'm asking this question because mm-hmm. how old your little one? She's three and a half. Oh, that's a, mm-hmm. that's a fun age. That's you like never know what you're going to get. <laughs> you never know. And it's a girl. So you, yeah. you're never going to know what you're going to get. I'm a 15 year old girl. I still don't know. Um, <laughs> How about evening? I mean, again, you're yeah. a mom to a toddler. Like what do your evenings so, look like? I was graced. If if we are successful with a second, then this will probably not be the case, but I was graced with like an amazing sleeper. Mm-hmm. So I am pretty lucky that she still goes to bed and I still have a couple hours after she goes to bed. Um, so it's nice to spend time with my husband. Um, and then we typically are like getting upstairs. I think my training in functional medicine has really evolved my nighttime routine. Cause at five, six years ago, it was like, let's watch TV. Yeah. Um, now it's like, let's go upstairs. Let's read a book. Let's yep. relax the nervous system. Maybe I listen to a meditation maybe once or twice a month. I'm like, let's do something really fancy and let's go have like a magnesium salt bath. Mm-hmm. Um, but nice. something to just relax and get ready for the evening. Yeah. And together time with your yeah. partner, right? Yeah. Like, which, it, and it doesn't have to be talking. Like if you just sit there reading books together, yeah. that's together time, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Things change once you have kids. And sometimes that's all you need is, to, yeah. you know, that's a level of intimacy right there. Like just Absolutely. being together. So last question, what is something, you know, now that you wish you knew five or 10 years ago? Oh, so I think the biggest thing is something I slightly touched on is that Um, if I were able to have known that no matter the struggle, no matter how big it feels in the moment, um, insurmountable, it might feel like I am capable, right. I'm going to be able to get through it. It may feel really tough. Um, it may take time. It may feel like no one else around me understands what the heck is going on in this brain of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've really been able to surprise myself and what I, I've been able to navigate. Mm-hmm. Um, and man, wouldn't that have been nice to know like that that was going to be possible mm-hmm. rather than being in it and thinking like, I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. So I think that would be the one thing. We're so much stronger than we think we are. Like we, yes. we women, we underestimate ourselves and I'm not saying yes. stronger. Like you have to, like, like we said before, you don't suppress everything like stronger yeah. in that. Like look we at can how move through it. Through move through it. And like, yeah. a, now you have this level of awareness that you didn't have before. And right. that's, you're so much stronger for that. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it just makes you much more resilient to a lot of things that life throws at you. Like Absolutely. Yes, you can navigate the emotions, but come out the other side and feel good, you know, still feel good and keep moving versus getting mm-hmm. stuck in that. I, I just say, always say stuck, but like that victim mode of like the yes. suffering, like you said, yes. the, the uh, dirty pain. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. So last but not least, like I'm sure so many women listening to this episode right now are going to want to reach out to you, get in touch with you, consume your podcast, all the things. So where do you like to hang out the most? What do you have going on currently? Yeah, absolutely. Tell us. Absolutely. So I hang out the most on Instagram at Sarah Brandel. 
uh, message me, ask me questions. I would love to meet you all. Um, and I, like she said, I have a podcast. It's the Path to Motherhood podcast comes out every single week. Um, it's a mixture of me sharing concepts and interviewing people. Um, and um, if someone is in the midst of trying to conceive and they're like dealing with those troubling two week waits that everybody gets so stressed out about, I actually have like a free workbook that has a reading prompt, um, a journal prompt, and a daily meditation for all of the days of the two week wait. Um, and it's, you know, for someone who is trying completely naturally all the way up to IVF, doesn't matter. Um, so you can download that and it'll be a free worksheet. I think you'll probably link it for us so they can get that. Yeah. Yeah. If you gave it to me, we'll link it. You know, that's, yep. that's brilliant. I saw that on your site. Like, oh, that's brilliant. Like yeah. you know, those two weeks that are so torturous waiting. So I love that. Yeah. I love that you serve the women you work with and the community with, with these um, resources. So thank you for doing what you do. You are definitely uh, serving an area that's not talked about very much, and, yeah. which is why I wanted to have you on the show, because this is something that we need to talk more about. And it's got to be, in my opinion, and again, this is my opinion, but part of the complete care of, of any woman, regardless of what she's going through, but especially in fertility and recurrent miscarriage. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I had so much fun. And with that, I'm out of here. Talk to you again soon.